All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Yeah? Great, okay. Well, by now I hope you've all had a chance to uh, explore the exhibition. I know it is a lot to take in. From the silver on display to the workbench and video content and even our brand new publication, the show you see before you today is the culmination of years of work undertaken by many both within the institution and beyond. It is my pleasure to share with you today a behind the scenes look at some of the types of work that we did to prepare for this exhibition. When you first entered the gallery, you may have been struck by the incredible shine of the silver before you. Now, I'm here to tell you that attaining and maintaining that shine was no small feat. One of the biggest aspects of planning this exhibition was the conservation of all of the silver. If you know a thing or two about silver, then chances are you know about tarnish. <laughs> this discoloration of silver and other metals occurs when they are exposed to elements in the air and can be difficult to remove. In April of 2016, just over three years ago, the museum embarked on the largest conservation project we've ever done. The project was headed by our conservator, Ingrid Newman, who led a team of volunteers that included staff, interns, students and faculty from RISD and Brown, as well as many, many community members. Over the course of three years, over 90 people generously volunteered their time, spending nearly 3,000 hours cleaning silver. The members of Team Silver, as they are affectionately known, were trained in the art of silver conservation. We began the process with an assessment of each object to, de to determine the level of treatment it should receive. While our goal for conservation was to clean the object and stabilize any structural issues, we also wanted to make sure that our treatments resulted in an appearance that was consistent with the object's age. This meant using a slow, controlled method of polishing in order to avoid overcleaning. So how did we clean the silver? Rest assured, our methods were conservator approved. There were no toothpastes or tin foil or Coca-Cola here. Um, no, we, we utilized a special cocktail of solvents, including denatured alcohol, ethanol, precipitated calcium carbonate, also known as chalk, which was mixed with distilled water. And we also use special cleaning cloths known as jeweler's rouge cloths, which are made up of red clay particles, which are particularly helpful when you're cleaning sensitive materials such as gilding. These, along with a keen attention to detail, allowed Team Silver to gently clean each object to the desired brilliance you see before you today. Since we started this project three years ago, you may be wondering how we managed to keep all of this silver shiny and relatively tarnish free. Well, after the objects were cleaned, they were wrapped in a layer of acid-free tissue paper, as you see on the left, and they were covered with a material called corrosion intercept. This plastic wrap-like film is made up of copper particles that neutralize any pollutants that come into contact with its surface. And after a few years of being wrapped in corrosion intercept, I think we can all attest to its effectiveness. RISD's larger objects that are not displayed under vitrines, such as the writing table and chair and monumental coffee pot and spoon, were cleaned and then covered with a, a wax to protect their surfaces and inhibit tarnish. Another significant undertaking was photography. Both the exhibition and the accompanying publication gave us an opportunity to photograph the newly conserved silver. It was also a chance to rethink how we wanted the silver to look in the photographs. Many of the objects had not been photographed since they came into the collection in 1991. A significant number had been coated in lacquer long before they arrived at the museum, which made their surfaces appear darker, and the tendency to photograph silver on a dark background to create contrast often did not serve these objects well. Post-conservation and removal of lacquer, 
We decided on a new style of photography, seen on the right, that featured lighter backgrounds and really highlighted the warmth of the silver. Of course, the major developments in photography over the past 20 years also helped a little bit with the quality. As a highly reflective material, silver presents a significant challenge to photograph. The project required a specific studio setup that involved diffusing the lighting and encasing objects in a white box, as you see here, with a small opening for the camera to avoid any reflections. Given the time that it took to create this setup, museum photographer Eric Gould spent over a year photographing only silver. The amount of photography time devoted to these objects also yielded a wealth of extraordinary detailed shots, which we were able to draw from and highlight in our publication. He even captured his own process in front of and behind the camera. And of course, one of our main centers for exhibition research was the Gorm Company Archive housed at the John Hay Library at Brown University. In the spring of 2016, we began our exploration of the vast quantities of archival material dating from 1831 to 2005. The first objects we were eager to explore were Gorham's large photo catalogs. Newly made objects would be photographed and those images compiled into index catalogs like you see here. These made their way to the public through Gorham's sales force and retailers ready to receive orders. We examined over 60 of these catalogs, ranging in date from 1869 to about 1907, and discovered images of objects in our own collection, including many from the Ferber service, which you will have seen highlighted in the exhibition pavilion, such as our fruit dish on the left and Cellini vase and stand on the right. Other collection objects include our Japanese black coffee pot and our new Bedford, Massachusetts souvenir spoon, the first Gorham object to enter the museum's collection. Beyond the pure excitement of turning page after page to find images of collection objects and those that were new to us, these discoveries also helped us to establish object titles and types, dates, and to track stylistic changes. More exciting still were Gorham's costing books and costing slips that recorded the dates, pattern numbers, and breakdown of the cost of making for every object. Hidden in these little columns are layers of information that were incredibly illuminating. Take for instance the record for our Sachem trophy pitcher, identified as a special order by the rectangle surrounding its object number, which you can see here on the right, we were able to locate its record in Gorham's costing book of specials. At the bottom, we see a note with the name Sachem. This was the schooner yacht owned and raced by Jesse Metcalf of Providence and to whom this trophy pitcher was awarded in 1887. Listed are the hours and cost of labor in making this pitcher. Noted in blue is the cost of the raw material, almost $60 worth of silver. Below in green, we see the amount of time for what is noted as the making of the object, the shaping of a flat disk of silver into the desired form. This took 68 hours for a total labor cost of $23.80. An additional 30 hours were spent chasing the elaborate marine imagery, and maybe they used that book of pressed seaweed for, uh, for inspiration, and etching took another 15 hours while well, we have buffing and polishing the hours for which are not recorded, but whose labor costs merely a dollar and change. You'll notice a blank section in red, which tells us something rather interesting, which is that no labor-saving mechanical steps such as spinning or turning are recorded here. This piece is the product of many hours of handwork, perhaps anticipating the way in which Gorm's Mardelay line would be produced almost a decade later. Through the costing books, we discovered objects in the exhibition that had been featured in World's Fairs, we noted how many examples of a particular type of object were made, and we even found orders placed by Henry Jewett Ferber for many of the gilded flatware sets you see upstairs today. 
Of course, we examined many other types of material in the archives that provided a deep understanding of the history of Gorham and all of its functions, from making to marketing and everything in between. And I particularly love these brochures which feature some important Q&A, such as, will my Gorham always be in fashion? And of course, the answer is yes. <laughs> Each, pat each Gorham pattern's timeless beauty will always be correct for your table and your home. <laughs> One of the remarkable things about Gorham is the level of depth with which they recorded their operations, not just with charts and graphs and memos, although there are plenty of those, but with photographs. And of course, you'll see these images time and time again today. They are just so spectacular in how they detail the expansiveness of their factory and its operations, really showing the pride they took in their new Elmwood facility. Photos also document workers engaged in highly specific and detailed operations of making, such as chasing, spinning, and stamping. But then there are the photographs that illustrate a more personal aspect of this monumental company, from baseball leagues to bowling matches and fishing trips. There is a spirit of camaraderie within Gorham that is captured in these moments outside of the factory. And if my research has taught me anything, that it's behind the mach machines and materials, these Gorham workers were just regular guys and gals with extraordinary talent and spirit really dedicated to their craft and their company. Of course, there's so much that I could tell you about the work that we did to make this all happen, but I think in close, I wanna say a huge thank you to everyone both within the museum and within the community who helped behind the scenes to make this exhibition possible. So thank you. Thank you.